Good afternoon. Let me start by thanking our friends at U.S. Chamber of Commerce Foundation for delivering what is already shaping up to be yet another informative and successful corporate citizenship conference. My name is Ron Estrada. I'm the head of government relations and corporate social responsibility at Univision Communications, the leading U.S. Hispanic media company. I will be moderating today's session on committing to equity. As we all know, the racial unrest and turmoil in 2020 has really catapulted us forward in terms of achieving racial equity. And it's clear building and maintaining a racial equity culture requi requires a completely new approach of addressing the situation. Largely, staff of color should not carry all the political risk of speaking up and carrying the flag of change. That said, why should the business community be concerned? Or the better question, how should businesses react? Here, here are a few points to ponder. When today's children are in their prime working years, people of color will represent half the total population and more than half of the working age population. Thus, a well-prepared, diverse workforce is critical to the success of U.S. businesses. Today's efforts require an entirely new approach, and some companies have already stepped up. For example, PayPal will invest $530 million to advance racial equity and inclusion. Apple committed $100 million to a new racial justice initiative. We just heard from Nancy Lamb about Dow's significant contribution as well. And soon you'll hear from executives at Prudential and PNC details of their efforts in driving change on racial equity. And here at Univision, we're finding new ways to foster an open dialogue in our community via town halls, special programming, and expanding our community partnerships. We're also focusing internally. One example was an all staff survey in which one of the things we heard is that there's a real need for more diversity at the top of the company. Well, just last week, we announced the appointment of four, in, four Hispanic independent directors. They're gonna join the new, uh, the new Univision board. But obviously, one action alone will not fix the situation. And yes, it starts at the board and CEO level. However, it will require day-to-day -day commitment from the top and bottom to advance this needed transformation to a just and equitable workspace. Now, let's explore some transformative examples today with Prudential Financial and PNC. It's my pleasure to introduce Veronica Arani Charkala, Vice President, Culture, Diversity and Engagement, Inclusive Solutions at Prudential Financial, and Marsha Jones, Executive Vice President and Chief Diversity Officer, PNC. I invite you all to visit the event website to view their impressive bios and accomplishments. Um, but for right now, Marsha, Ronnie, thank you both for joining us. Let's jump right into it, okay? Great, thank you for having me. All right, so great, great. Um, so Marsha, let's start with you and Ronnie, I'm gonna ask you the same question. So broadly speaking, what is the role of companies in driving change on racial equity? Well, as we've been discussing, Ronnie, we're living in truly unprecedented times, and we have the convergence of a global health crisis, economic decline, and one of the most significant civil rights movements of our time. And we believe at PNC, the corporations have a responsibility to act and an opportunity to respond in a way that drives meaningful and sustainable change for those who need it most. Uh, we think that it's a time to examine the role the companies play in affecting positive change for stakeholders to assess their strengths, how they can play a part in driving racial equity and social injustice for employees and their communities. And that's going to look different for every single company. So just as we know, uh, every, every corporation's journey of inclusion is different. Uh, we know that every company's reaction is going to be different. And we heard from the previous panel how uh, each of their individual companies uh, is also uh, impacting uh, the current experiences in a very unique way. So as a financial institution, PNC recognizes the opportunity to put our capital to work in the community, to drive innovation through products as well as services. We're approaching our community development banking efforts in a more deliberate focus on the African-American community. We're expanding our established uh, employee volunteerism program to include qualifying social justice and economic empowerment nonprofits. And we're also recognizing that there are opportunities for improvements as well. So committing to an intensified focus on the recruitment, retention, and advancement of Black talent 
and a more comprehensive and sustained effort to create a more inclusive culture at PNC. Great, thank you, Marcia. Ronnie, I'm gonna ask you the same question again as, you know, broadly speaking, you know, what is the role of companies in driving change on racial equity? Yeah, thank you, Ron. Um, and, and similar to Marsha, um, you'll hear a lot of uh, similarities there. We think at Prudential that companies do have a very large role that they could be playing to, to drive the change. And simply stated is pivoting to a new form of capitalism that is good for all stakeholders um, so that they can become a force for the greater good. Um, and it's not a brand new um, theory. It's been around for a couple of years and some companies have already moved forward with um, that work. But the idea really rejects the notion that companies are only in business for a profit, um, but instead that they can take action on behalf of their, a broad set of stakeholders like their communities, like their vendors, um, in addition to their employees and their state, their shareholders, which are the traditional um, stakeholders that they're interested in. But they're, it just broadens out the value so that they can then focus on business and society value at the same time, not one in place of the other. Um, and that really, what that means is then you really have a focus on your internal policies. Um, some of the things Marsha already mentioned, how, how do you create an inclusive culture that has really meaningful biz, uh, behavioral changes? Um, how you do your product design? Is it accessible? Who are you advocating for? How are you investing in your community? These are all things that we part of stakeholder um, capitalism. Um, and incidentally, this is not um, the public is actually unified, which is an interesting statement to even say when we talk about division, but the public is unified in this desire. Um, there was a study done by Just Capital. They go out and poll Americans, um, and this was about 9,000. And even though it was um, no, th not this year, it still stands true. And basically what they found is that um, the public is really unified in their desire that companies do both um, do both a business good and social good. And um, they, they're coming at it from both being a consumer and also a potential future applicant. So the statistic here, which I thought I would share is that 76% of Americans said when they consider that said when considering accepting a job that they would opt to work for a company that's more just, even if it meant them getting a pay, a pay cut, even up to about 20% of a pay cut. So that's pretty significant. If you're thinking about that um, in terms of how it impacts society. And then also 78% of Americans said that they had taken some sort of action to show their support for companies who do have this positive behavior. So more than half of them, that action that they took was directly buying the company's products or increasing the products that they buy from a company. So these are really great proof points as to why this idea of stakeholder um, capitalism is really, really important for companies to stay relevant going forward. Yep, Ronnie, thank you for sharing those those stats. Those are very, you know, critical and very eye-opening for the business community. And I'm wondering too if if those if that same kind of survey questionnaire was asked today, if we would see those numbers go even higher than where they were, because 70%, 70% is high, uh, you know. That's a great point, Ron. They actually said in the study that they've been doing the study for a number of years, starting in 2015, and every single year those numbers jump. Oh, thanks again for sharing that. Um, let me pivot over to Marcia. Marcia, you, you've touched on some of your the company's external kind of efforts in promoting racial equity. But can you highlight some for the you know for the um, for our viewers here some some kind of key external activities activations that you've seen successful? You've been working on that are promoting racial equity. So certainly uh, in June, we uh, announced more than a billion dollars to help uh, as systemic racism and support economic empowerment of uh, black Americans and low and moderate income uh, communities. Uh, the majority of this commitment is actually going to be uh, serviced through our community development banking, uh, but also uh, includes philanthropic component and an extension of our employee volunteerism program. And you know, I would say that our, our community development banking uh, has had a uh, stellar record of 40 years of consistent, outstanding ranking in terms of our CRA, CRA efforts. So to uh, Ronnie's point earlier, uh, this is not necessarily something that is new necessarily to the organization. It's something that uh, diversity and inclusion is actually one of our core values and has been over the last 25 years. And what we are essentially doing is uh, bringing those core values to play uh, in the current environment we are in. Um, we, our commitment to uh, DNI, as I mentioned, is not new, and we've embraced uh, a, an inclusive 
a culture of, in order for us to not only have a better company, but also to be able to be a better employer, a better neighbor, and a better investor. Central to the core business is of PNC's prosperity uh, will be the uh, proportion to how we're able to enhance those low and moderate income communities that uh, Ronnie uh, referred to earlier, uh, those communities where our employees and our customers uh, work and where we serve. And we recognize the fact that the needs, uh, that there's a lot that has to be done, that we need to be able to partner with many uh, corporations uh, in our various markets in order to be able to uh, make this happen. So some considerations I would say that we have had over the last couple of years might include the following. We've broadened our definition of diversity and inclusion to go beyond race, ethnicity, and other factors. So our definition of diversity is the differences that make each of our 53,000 employees unique. And we, when we think about inclusion, we want to be able to create an environment where everyone is not necessarily just seen, but where their opinion is actually heard and then is actually able to be acted on. We have introduced a number of resources uh, to be able to help our employees as well as our managers uh, to be able to uh, work on these uh, uh, particular focuses that we have. And also, uh, obviously, as many organizations have, naturally we've trained our managers as well as our employees on unconscious bias and micro behaviors, which we know are really key in order to be able to, uh, to assist in creating these things. So what happens is that when our employees create that inclusive environment internally, it helps us to be able to then demonstrate that inclusive environment as we develop relationships with our external customers and our communities. And thereby we show up as an organization that actually cares and actually listens and then actually acts on what it is that we are hearing as needs of those various communities, which help us to be able to grow as an organization. Impressive, impressive. But I, I just jotted down a, a, a nice point here that you just, I just wanted to underscore this. So basically, you're no longer, you're not just looking to looking for employees or talent to fit within your culture. You're changing the the company's culture to fit with this diverse population. And I think absolutely, that right there is absolutely, absolutely, because what we believe is, and and actually, it's been led by our uh, CEO Bill Demchek, who uh, when he uh, began his tenure indicated the fact that his vision for the organization is that managers of people not only deliver business results, but also are able to create diverse and talented teams because from his own personal experience, he has actually seen how diverse and talented teams actually help to be able to innovate and can actually be more competitive. And so he is really living out this vision. And we, over the last several years, have been on this journey of creating this uh, inclusive culture where we recognize and have for a long time the changing demographics of the country and the need for us to be able to be competitive by not only welcoming that changing demographic as part of the workforce, and also to be able to create relationships with that, those diverse customers, because that's actually how we're going to become that much more profitable. Excellent. Thank you. Thank you. So, so Ronnie, the, how is the drive for equity changing how you do business? Um, yeah, that's a that's a great question. I think we we definitely know that, um, and we've known for uh, we've been in this business a long time. We've known that it is a moral imperative. So we we always we always say that we never want to forget that. But there has been significant changes around the, on the business side, and and what's driving that. Um, we talked a little bit about it, but there's global demographics that are playing right. They're shifting and becoming increasingly more diverse. Um, so you have to have products and solutions, and people who uh, associates and those who can think. Um, uh, uh, in a very diverse way in order to match that diversity that we're seeing uh, globally. Um, one thing we do know is that millennials right now are already representing 30% of the population and they are the most diverse generation in US history. 44% um, of them um, are ethnic and racial minorities. So there's no way you can stay relevant if you're not aware of that and you're shifting and building to, uh, in that way. Um, in addition, though, not just demographics, customer attitudes are shifting as well. Um, so DNI strategies are critically important. Um, so customers uh, to customers as we mentioned earlier. So then that means they're critical to your future growth as well. So um, I have another statistic actually that I got from Accenture. 42% um, of customers are saying that they would pay a premium 
right, uh, of, of up to about 5% for a retailer or a customer who has a visible commitment to IND, like the ones Marsha is mentioning and the ones that were focused on at Prudential. But conversely, if they don't see that and a failure to promote that really can do some serious damage to your brand um, uh, around that and, and a loss of market share. So um, what we're doing, um, my role specifically, uh, my team is culture, diversity, engagement, as you mentioned, um, and Marsha mentioned this earlier as well, we're really focused on creating that inclusive culture within the company. Um, exactly as uh, Marsha mentioned, it's not just the words, but have, you know, a feeling of belonging and really meaningful behavior shifts. Um, and companies who focus on that, we know um, it improves their employee loyalty and retention and productivity. So that directly impacts your customers. So one of the things that we're doing, um, which I think has been really insightful, uh, I'm responsible within my work to um, to take to for the strategy across all of our business resource groups. Um, we have eight of those and they represent different um, underrepresented groups within, within the firm. Um, and we're using that group, which by their nature, their very nature are very diverse. Um, we're using that group to create a consumer insights council. So um, we're doing something that's a little bit more systemic. So the rest of the enterprise can tap into them in a very nimble way um, to get some consumer insights, whether they're launching a product or um, there's a marketing piece and they're checking for marketing uh, voice and tone or an experience. It could be a digital experience, um, looking at a website. So we're at the early stages, but we have had some early successes in using this Consumer Insights Council. Um, and that's going to feed into kind of the way we do business going forward. Um, in addition, there's a benefit there because the, the, the members of our BRGs have a great talent exposure as part of that. And that keeps them engaged. So um, they're having access to um, business leaders that they might not have access to and helping them solve a problem that's really not in their day-to-day kind of function. So there's really a double benefit there. And so there's several things that we're doing to pivot to ensure that we're, we're taking that, um, that view. We're also um, in the middle of um, some transformative um, strategies. And one of the things that we're asking any future initiative to have is an equity lens. So we need to apply an equity lens to any new, um, whether it's a a strategy within your business alone or it could be externally facing, we are asking all of our leaders to take um, a view of that through a, to, through an equity lens and really making sure that they understand the impact of their, of their initiatives to not only our vendors, you know, our diverse suppliers, to our employees, to the product development, to the distribution. So it's really been quite, um, quite transformative just in the thinking alone. Well, that's um, you touched on a lot of good good points here. Uh, I just want to validate the Consumer Insight Council and the use of internal kind of groups and gatherings and and, uh, and committees. They're very helpful, and as we kind of look at racial equity, and one of the things I just if I, you know I'm sure you get this all the time. Your title, you know, culture, diversity, and engagement, inclusive solutions, inclusive solutions. I love it. That's great. I hope to see more of that in in other titles. Um, we, we have time for, for I believe, um, one, one more question each here, and I'd like to go back to you, Marsha. Um, again, PNC, you, know, you just shared the uh, just extraordinary amount, of, and I jotted it down. I want to make sure I got this right. It's a billion with a B, right, was the commitment here. Um, you, you, you put a significant amount of capital to work here in the communities that you serve. How is COVID-19 impacting that deployment of that capital? So I would say that as uh, as an organization, one of the things, and I think we've alluded to it before, that uh, particularly on several of the other panels, that the organization has had to really pivot, if you would, towards uh, how we are uh, focused on just reacting, if you would, to COVID, uh, how we go about in terms of the uh, the need, for example, uh, in, uh, of implementing our PPP, okay, in terms of loan, the ability of us to be able to pull our teams together to be able to execute on uh, the uh, the input of all the loans that needed to take place, as well as now, you know, servicing of those particular loans. And so, one of the things that we are most proud of, as many organizations are, but we're most proud of uh, how our employees were able to actually pivot during that period of time to be able to do whatever was necessary in order to be able to be successful in terms of uh, the amount of loans that we actually had. But in addition to that, um, it's also a question of how our 
uh, organizations, our employee business resource groups, our line of business councils, our regional councils, et cetera, which are so dependent on face-to-face -face communication and support, we're able to pivot to a virtual kind of an environment. And so as we are thinking about creating that kind of an innovative uh, environment where we're able to touch, if you would, um, each of our employees to be able to recognize that in this kind of uh, COVID environment where everyone is at home, where we're now working virtually, whereas opposed to uh, being able to see each other face to face and have that human contact, we had to be able to be creative as to how you create that kind of a semblance of that uh, impact so that we can in fact continue to be as effective connecting with one another as, as best we can. And so it has enabled us as well as our leaders within uh, our various uh, diversity initiatives to be able to uh, exercise that innovation in order to be able to help them as well as to be able to then think about how do you creatively assist our customers, right? In terms of uh, being successful in this kind of a COVID environment. So it helps to be able to demonstrate all of the skills that we want to be able to uh, develop within our employees. It enabled us to actually put that into action. And we're very, very pleased with the way that we've been able to respond. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Thank you, Marcia. So, Ronnie, I know we had just a couple minutes left here. You know, we talked a lot about the external factors and partnerships and community facing activations and such. But if you could touch on for those that, you know, that are in a company right now and, and for your colleagues that are inside Prudential, what are you doing to ensure equal opportunities for the, the, the talent that you have in there, inside? Okay, inside the organization. Okay. Mm -hmm. um, and, there, and there's a number of initiatives. So Prudential has been committed both externally and internally, um, as Marsha mentioned earlier, um, to talent and other um, in other ways of, of skilling for the future. And um, probably since 1978, I think around that time, Prudential's Foundation um, has contributed about over $920 million to help eliminate some of those barriers to financial and social uh, mobility for those underserved populations. In addition to that, um, we, we made about $180 million commitment to uh, connect opportunity youth skills training programs um, and, and employment of those individuals through 2025. So that's kind of a little bit on the external side and we have a whole host of other partnerships. We have about 40 other partners that we work with to um, obtain, obtain not only talent for the company, but also to skill that talent and um, to work with partners to um, build their capacity. But on the inside, um, there's a number of initiatives also that Prudential is focused on because one of the things we heard very loud and clear from our employees is that it's not just a hiring issue, right? I mean, hiring is extremely important and you really have to do it well, but touching back on that inclusion. So one of the things we heard, um, we had done over um, over 100 listening sessions with 7,000 employees this summer. And one of the things we heard loud and clear was to really make sure we're also focusing on the retention and mobility of our diverse talent within the company. And we're doing that through a, a number of ways. Um, one of the things that we're working on internally, um, in addition to uh, some of the things I mentioned externally, is mentorship programs, both formal, informal, um, for our diverse associates. Some of them are sponsored through our business resource groups. So for those who are listening who have um, business resource groups, this is a great place to start if you have it. Um, as a matter of fact, our Black Leadership Forum just really leads the way in our company around um, a mentoring program that they have. It's very successful. Um, I actually had the privilege of being a coach for that program this year. Um, and so we're going to take the elements of that program, which is very successful, and sort of try to leverage those components to all of our other BRGs so that we can have um, a a little bit more um, activity going on across all of them. The other thing um, that we're doing um, is we have a program called Transformational Leadership. And that's a program, it's in its fifth year. We actually had graduation this week. Um, I was very excited. It's about a nine month program. Um, it focuses in on developing the skills of uh, multicultural women. And it's, it's just a terrific program. We have an outside partner, Blue Circle, that we work with to bring that program. It's 100% um, online. So we were uh, very fortunate that we didn't have to skip a beat this year with all the challenges that we had. Um, and that program increased this year over last year by about 65% because it's such a successful program. Um, and in addition, something that Marcia mentioned earlier, we also have had a focus on inclu inclusion training. Um, I think most companies have, but I think the point on that is that, um, you know, there's a lot of folks who say that the training itself is not enough, and I would agree. So we're approaching it as a journey. 
um, and something that everyone's on and they're on a different place in that journey. So we have to keep reinforcing it. So everything from how to be an effective ally and an upstander in the moment, techniques where you can kind of like de-escalate situations and really step up and talk about things in a way that's uh, non-confrontational. Um, so all of those trainings kind of build off of each other. And then we have some reinforcement of those trainings. And of course, um, additional trainings for leaders who, you know, are really well-intended that might need a little bit more help in understanding where bias is showing up in the workplace. So it really is a multi-pronged strategy to make sure that we're looking after our um, highly talented, diverse associates and ensuring that they have a good experience and that they feel like they belong here. I think with every company, we, we always want to do more. So um, again, it's, it's a journey that we're on and uh, we look forward to making a lot more progress on that this year. Fabulous. That's great work. Well, it looks like we're at, at our time right now for us to conclude the session. Um, we covered a lot of ground a lot of great points, a lot of good, great, you know, sharing of, of um, good programs and information. And I hope we were able to solve some questions for our viewers today. I'm sure we were. Uh, I'd like to thank both uh, Ronnie and Marsha, as well as the U.S. Chamber of Commerce Foundation staff for making this session happen. And I invite you all to keep the conversation going via social media with hashtag business solves. Thank you again. And uh, please enjoy the rest of your day. Thank you. Thank you.